Hi, and welcome to the Rare Business Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm a consultant, advisor, researcher, and writer on all things related to customer service and customer experience. Through this podcast, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, and leading thinkers about what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees in this fast-moving modern age that we live in. If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com, as I've now completed over 250 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then thank you for returning, and I'll aim to do a good enough job to keep you coming back week after week. Anyway, that's enough from me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Jonathan Lacoste, who is co-founder and president of Jebet, and his colleague, Ben Cockrell, who is the VP of Marketing over at Jebet. Hi, both. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you doing? Morning, Adrian. I am very well, gentlemen. So, Jonathan and Ben, can you know, for the benefit of our leaders, for our Jonathan and Ben, actually, for the benefit of our listeners and readers, can you tell us a bit about you and a bit about the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, Ben and I both work at a company called Jebit, mm-hmm. uh, based in Boston, as you mentioned. It's a, a venture backed startup here in the city that's uh, actually been around for about seven years. So the quick backstory is um, a former classmate of mine, uh, we went to undergrad at uh, Boston College, um, ended up starting this company as part of a business plan competition back in 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. Uh, It got a little bit of legs and uh, we ended up actually leaving school early and pursuing it full time in 2013. And to make a very long story short, we have basically built over the past four or five years what we think to be is the world's first declared data platform. So we're really focused on solving kind of two core problems for our, our partners and companies. And we'll jump a lot more into this later uh, and throughout the uh, conversation today. But at a very high level, our enterprise customers and, and some of the world's largest, most recognizable brands uh, use Jebit to help solve the challenge of mobile conversion and how to put mobile first content in front of their audience right. and the challenge of collecting and uh, using the most valuable first party data in a uh, you know more transparent, explicit manner uh, of collection that they get that from consumers. So, uh, broadly speaking, uh, that's kind of what Ben and I focus on every day. Fantastic. I mean, that's the, the, I mean that's really interesting. And, and, and before we get into sort of Jebit and declared data platform and, and all of that type of cool stuff that you guys are doing, I mean, because you're actually in the the mix that is, and the maelstrom that is mobile marketing data and all that sort of stuff. I mean, that's been it's just dominating. The news right now, you know, mobiles, data manipulation of customers, and you know all of this sort of stuff. Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, and they're they're only the things that we're seeing kind of right now. I'm sure there's going to be more to that story as it all pans out. I mean, it'd be interesting for me to get, given that you're right at the, I feel like the vanguard or the front end of this. It'd be interesting to get your view on what you think are some of the main challenges facing firms right now when it comes to this idea of mobile marketing, engagement, consumer data, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I think a couple of the ones that when we're talking to chief marketing officers, chief digital officers of these Fortune 500 companies, a couple, a couple of things come to mind. One is just the creation process of content now. Mm-hmm. We, we all agree that everyone is glued to their mobile devices and that more attention and traffic and, and even purchasing power than ever before is is going through these small devices we hold in our hands and check 200 times a day. Mm-hmm. The, the issue or the challenge, though, is how do we transform a very large organization that has been creating mobile responsive content and has been coached and programmed to create content like that and how do we transform it to creating mobile first content experiences at scale many times a day? Right. Because really kind of interact with this new era consumer that has a mobile mindset and is, is interacting for 30 to 60 seconds at a time, whether you're in line at Starbucks or jumping into an elevator and instantly checking your phone, that's a very different type of relationship and contextual conversation. So I think broadly the first challenge is just how do you create contextually relevant content and put it out at scale consistently? And right. that is not an easy challenge to solve. On the consumer data front, I think broadly speaking, what we're seeing, Adrian, is companies actually have more data than they know what to do with. Mm-hmm. And the vast, vast amounts of data they're sitting on are actually causing a ton of complexities that are unnecessary. They are 
because of the advancement of a lot of our technologies and analytic solutions, we're actually collecting and capturing more data than most companies even need, far beyond that. And so a lot of the challenges that companies are trying to think through is, what is the most important data I need? What data of that do I already have? And how do I uh, thoughtfully and somewhat efficiently use that data to have a better relationship and conversation with my consumer? And again, that involves a lot of different systems and technologies, and I don't think anyone has completely nailed it yet. Yeah, no, it makes me think about the, you know, the, so the, the personalized kind of content that you can, deli- that you can deliver people at scale is, I think is going to be a, a perennial kind of problem uh, within, within all that. I mean, because that requires, you know, creative and writing and video and all sorts, and audio and all sorts of different sort of things. So I guess that's, it, it, I'm, I can see that kind of sticking, that sort of issue sticking around for, for some time unless we all en masse kind of dump our mobiles, which I can't see uh, happening anytime soon. But the interesting thing that you can say about, the, uh, about most brands having more data than they know what to do with, I mean, that reminds me of, a, uh, of something. I had a conversation with uh, Yasha, Yasha Kekas Wolf, who is the CMO across at Mozilla last year. And he was describing a concept as a result of this sort of issue, I call, what he called lean data is almost like only collect the data that you know what you're going to do with, or only collect sufficient data that allows you to fulfill the sort of your stated sort of objectives. I mean, do you actually think that that's kind of that's one of the main kind of challenges is that that actually companies are just collecting and then thinking about it rather than actually thinking about what they want to achieve and then thinking about what data they need, and it's almost a bit like. They're, they're, they're putting the cart before the horse in many ways. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Adrian. I think when we're talking to a lot of senior marketing executives, if, if they had a magic wand, they might remove their entire database and start over again with exactly that in mind, which is, you know, if you, if you, had, if you could have a conversation with any customer, what would you ask? What would be the three or four data points that would actually move the needle for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of times that goes beyond the sort of transactional or behavioral and into the psychographic. What's the why behind the buy? What really motivates a consumer? Sure. And, you know, that's what really we're really trying to facilitate here at Jebit, which is, you know, that deeper conversation between a brand and a consumer, Mm -hmm. uh, one where both you know, sort of um, gain to uh, both gain from a deeper understanding, but also one that is sort of transparent and responsible in that sort of data collection and activation. And the onus is on the brand to sort of only collect um, what's most relevant and important and then activate that for the consumer to ultimately see value. Sure. And I think when you're thinking about, you know, some of the, the things that you mentioned earlier, where brands can get in in trouble as jonathan said is maybe on that that undue complexity side and the challenges around data management um, that come from that undue complexity excellent i mean i think it's yeah it's a fascinating kind of thing i mean it's almost a bit like it's almost it it feels like that and i guess again it's probably a perennial challenge that it's it's easier to do i kind of do and collect than it is to think if you know what i mean and i think that that almost speaks to a uh, psychological th- way that we're wired because so we're you know to actually make choices about what to do and what not to do is more difficult than actually just continue to do I uh, just let's collect and then we'll figure it out go so the thing yeah. the, the data will divine where we should go rather than actually stepping back and going actually conceptually where do we, what do we need and where are we going to go and that organization is always always feels really hard because it's almost like we're set up to do because we think doing is a, th- is a way to value rather than actually stopping. And sort of, the, you know, it gives weight to that whole, what's it, that, that, old, um, that old saying, was it less haste, more speed? Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I think when we, you know, not to dive into the technology, but when we talk to senior marketers about their tech stack and, you know, where they're placing their dollar, mm-hmm. uh, you know, nearly all of it is going to solve the problem of personalization from, a technology standpoint in terms of how you can activate that. Mm-hmm. But the smart marketers are looking at pushing more of that dollar toward the data that can underpin and power 
that personalization because ultimately if you're activating bad data um, in a very sophisticated way through your technology stack, what's the result? The result is probably not very good if the underlying data isn't really there to really power that personalization. And I think, you know, I'll turn it over to, to Jonathan to, to sort of describe more of that. But that's really when I joined Jebit, that was one of the, the, the underpinning reasons is that some of the data that that we're collecting that's explicitly given by a consumer once activated yeah it's, is seeing incredible lift and also and lift in brand affinity because because of that you know deepened relationship where the consumer understands the data that they're offering yes and and the brand is responsibly activating that with with relevance to why they collected it in the first place okay we're talking about data we're talking about you're talking about activation. You're talking about permissions and things. I mean, I guess that you know people might be listening to this and going, "Well, how does this play with the whole, particularly here in the uh, in Europe, the GDPR compliant based stuff that's coming in later, you know, this year or like in, actually in the next couple of months?" I mean, is because it's the the permission is is very explicit. Does that make you automatically compliant? Yeah, it's a great question. So with GDPR, there's a couple of levels here. There's the actual collection of the data and the <laughs> compliance there. And then there's the actual storage of the data yeah. and where you're housing that. And then there's the actual permission set of being able to consistently update and, and, and freshen that set of data. Mm -hmm. um, not getting into the technological weeds, any technology company, uh, whether they're in the marketing world or not, that is collecting data is going to have to solve the second challenge of housing that data appropriately yeah. based in the EU or the UK, right? So we're, we're compliant there along with a lot of our other colleagues in the industry on that one. Mm -hmm. On the first piece, we're also absolutely compliant on how we're collecting data. It, it's kind of interesting when we started the company we thought just conceptually that it would be a better relationship for the consumer to be in control of explicitly sharing and declaring what information they wanted to mm -hmm. have fans know about them. I never truthfully thought that we would actually get to the point of regulation already at this at, at this stage in 2018, but, but we already are there. And so I think that's actually a fantastic win for consumers that are looking for more control and transparency. Mm -hmm. Our technology ends and where the brand's responsibility begins, Adrian, right. is we're encouraging all the brands to have an overarching strategy that allows them, uh, their, their audiences, to consistently update the information that they have on, on those consumers. Right? Right. So if you declare something at one point and for some reason you decide you're no longer interested in that brand knowing that particular data point – Brands need, whether it's data collected via a platform like Jebit or based on what you're clicking on their website or, or transacting, they need an overarching strategy for that. Um, and so that's kind of where we draw the line. And so, so we've talked a lot about that now. So tell me a little bit more about you know, this, the, the declared data platform that, 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 you're, that you're building or you've built rather and, and actually kind of how it, how it kind of works because – I mean, that's, I guess that's, the, that's your approach is that's the point of difference, right? Exactly. And I think going back to one of your original questions around what are the biggest challenges we're seeing in the space today? Mm -hmm. let's, let's put ourselves in, in the shoes of a marketer. The, the conversation that we're having is we have too much data. It's causing enormous complexities. And almost for the first time ever, enterprises are being hardwired in the past. Like there's a reason they've been collecting so much data. The risk mitigation for them was – it was riskier not to collect it than to collect it because they you never know what the application is. We're sure. starting to see that turn though. Now it's almost riskier to collect it and not do anything with it. Risk a breach, risk a, a lack of trust or transparency with your com consumers, lack of compliance mm -hmm. than it is to uh, not collect it, right? So we're seeing this fundamental shift in how companies think about collecting and using consumer data from their audiences. And so where the declare data platform fits into that quite simply is what Ben was saying earlier around the idea that marketers to really have a more personalized conversation actually don't need a hundred data points on you, Adrian, right, <laughs> they no. might work, right to have a contextually relevant conversation. And so it's this idea of let's really take a step back, use machine intelligence and just, you know, pure human ingenuity and think about what are the most important data points we need to collect to have a more relevant, personalized, contextually relevant conversation. And if we can solve that problem scalably across our consumers, 
That allows us to not house and sit on as much data. That simplifies the complexities, but it also builds trust and relationships. And so at its core, Jebit helps you collect that data by creating mobile first experiences and putting them in the midst of all of those micro moments that you engage throughout the day with a brand on social media, in your inbox, through a text message, things of that nature. Perfect. I, mean, I think that's go, go ahead. I think that's absolutely right. And I think one of the things Jonathan noted um, and 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 is so so sort of um, compelling about what we're trying to build here is we're not just trying to solve a brand marketing problem. We're also trying to solve a consumer problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Forrester put out some research last year about you know what they're sort of calling this privacy versus personalization paradox. 75% mm -hmm. of consumers ex expect and want digital personalization, but 49% have privacy and data protection concerns. And the numbers are rising when they've done that survey year over year on both sides. Mm -hmm. They want more personalization and they want, and they have more concerns around how that data to power that personalization is being used. And so I think to Jonathan's point and what we're trying to build here, it's, Let's let's be thoughtful on the brand side and consultative and come up with what are the data points that will truly move the needle. Yeah. And but also provide value to the consumer. And let's be really transparent on what the consumer is explicitly providing that the brand is then activating. Yeah, no, that's 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 great. I mean, but then that kind of makes me think about kind of the, you know that so I can see this kind of flow and the applications that's there where you guys can like sit and you talk about the, the the consumer the customer sort of updating their own sort of data but that then makes me think about who actually owns the data and how is what you're doing different from some of the the things that are going on is you know the the personal information economy sphere which is very much at the give customers back control of the data or actually and let them sort of if you like define the relationships or define the brands that they want to have relationships with and then it becomes a push relationship with them so i just wanted to sort of understand how you sort of fit in that continuum between customer and brands and 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 the, the ownership of the data if that makes sense yeah sure so i mean I think to to break down those two elements the first element in terms of who controls the data mm -hmm. uh, so the the brand controls the data, but ultimately the consumer controls um, what they're explicitly providing to right. the brand. Right. So I think the personal information economy is a fascinating um, is a fascinating space, um, and one that I think is is important when we talk about responsible marketing. Right. And you know I think. What we have built um, was not purpose built for that to be transparent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're talking about transparency here, but it's very similar and complementary, right? Because we are explicitly giving um, the consumer the the opportunity for how and what they want to share with the brand. Sure. And what we really consult the brands that we work with around the activation of this data is it has to be it has to be relevant and it has to be providing value to the end consumer right yeah so you know to jonathan's point we're we are creating a quality a quality at scale not quantity for nothing data application solution here at jebit and when the that data is being activated by the brands they're saying they're seeing huge lift mm -hmm. and then I would say on the flip side for the consumer, we are seeing brands that activate that data increase their brand affinity because they're providing more contextually relevant experiences to the consumer. So it's actually increasing uh, the lifetime value uh, of that consumer for the brand. Perfect. I mean, that, that's I can see how there's value. I mean, you know, if you go back to the Forrester research that you cited. And I think there's there's this interesting, uh, like you alluded to, is that there's this interesting dynamic where people say they want personalization, but then there's a whole bunch of people that have got privacy concerns. And within that sort of the, those people that have privacy concerns, there is a whole spectrum of v different views or you know grades of sort of concern. 
And I think there's sort of the nuance, uh, and this is a thing that's I think is emerging in, in marketing is to figure out the psychographics of privacy and, and what that spectrum kind of looks like. And I th- it feels like an, an, an element of control in terms of in, in being able to influence the conversation with what you get and what you don't, you know, so you can tell people, tell brands what you want and, in, and, and, and what you don't want is, 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 is only a good thing. But I think that, that, that what would be useful, because this is all going to seem slightly esoteric to people just kind of like listening in and go like, what does this mean in practice? Is if you, if you guys could give us a couple of examples of like some firms that are, you know, following this approach, it could be clients of yours, uh, for example, that just to kind of bring it to light in terms of some of the challenges that they faced and uh, what they've done and how that, you, that your declared data platform has helped them you know, achieve the lifts that you've been you've been mentioning. Just sort of give it a bit more color, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm very visual as well. So I'll invite everyone to kind of use our imagination here on, on the podcast to think through, to your point, Adrian, how this comes to life. Mm-hmm. I think a couple examples that are at different levels of sophistication of customer use cases, right, um, that provide value to both them and the consumer. Mm-hmm. So uh, in the spirit of uh, talking to our friends across the pond. Uh, a UK-based uh, retail brand, Bowdoin. You might be familiar with them. Uh-huh. Um, so Bowdoin is a, a great example of someone that's embraced this declare data movement. Right. And what they frequently do is on social media, they'll put out interactive content experiences that invite consumers to engage in a little bit more of an exploratory discovery piece of content, kind of going through lookbooks, going through their catalog, <laughs> uh, exploring different products and, and categories. And essentially self-selecting things, not based on the product, right? If you ever have been to an e-commerce website, the filters all kind of look the same. Yeah. Product size, product, uh, you know, uh, different specs, elements of that. It's all about the product. Whereas these experiences are all about the consumer. Yes. They're all about the motivations, the style, the psychographics of it. And so specifically with Bowdoin, what we see when they put out this type of content is – they use the experience to send you to a pre-filtered, personalized commerce uh, page on their website. But the difference is it's all pre-filtered based on your motivations and psychographics that you're sharing in that moment as opposed to the size or the the color that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different way of shopping and the results have been phenomenal. For Bowdoin, on average, they're seeing a 33 34% increase in the cart size and actually around a 52 53% higher conversion rate. Cool. And so for a, a small retailer that's trying to you know, use social media to drive their business, you know, that's, that's pretty exciting. I think the second level to this is, okay, Bowdoin in the moment used that declare data to immediately send someone to a more personalized and relevant landing experience, shoppable experience, right? The yeah. next level is how do we continue that conversation to the next two or three touch points when you interact with them? In the travel space, a great brand that's doing this is the airline uh, Cathay Pacific. Mm-hmm. So Cathay Pacific has kind of taken this idea that when you fly with them, they want to be a partner of yours not only on the journey to your destination but also once you arrive. So a lot of their new products and services are not only around the flights themselves but are bundled packages around – maybe even the hotels or the excursions and activities you can do there. So I know for myself when I travel, it's very personal in terms of my motivations and interests, the different types of activities and things I want to do upon arrival. You know, preference wise, do I prefer more of an urban, uh, you know, go, go, go environment or do I prefer to take a step out into the countryside and and go for a hike? Uh Those are some of the preferential data points that they're capturing over one or two experiences so that they can continue to recommend not only dream destinations that I might want to go to that I've never been to before, um, but also if I book my next trip through them, items and kind of providing value of what I'll be really interested in when I arrive. Right. And even though that may not drive a direct ROI and dollar to an additional flight in that moment with Cathay Pacific, they're taking the long view of continuing to provide better value to their customers by knowing them better and providing more relevant experiences. And so I think that's, that's an interesting notion too. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, so it feels to me that um, when you talk about sort of Bowdoin, it, I mean, it just strikes me and it's like, it's probably like stating the blindingly obvious, but it's like, if you do smarter stuff, you get better results. 
and some of the results, you know, they're sort of 30, 40 percent kind of, in, you know, higher kind of cart size. And what was the 50 percent or and above conversion? Conversion. Rates? Yeah. I mean, you just you look at it, and just go, uh, why wouldn't you do it like that? That just kind of makes so much sense. And the Cathay Pacific side of things, I, it, what I what I like about that one is that it's actually focused on the on the relationship. And it's not purely transactional sort of thing. So it's always, yeah, as you say, playing the long game. But do, but be, being willing to do stuff, which is, yes, it can be measurable. So you can measure the engagement of it. But it's not got a, a an automatic and clear ROI in the short term. But you, it's a, it's more of a lifetime value type of uh, type, type of play, which is kind of, so it's nice. It's a, the two different examples. That's great. Yeah, and, and with both of those brands, the commonality there is they're both luxury brands, right? Right. And so having a more personalized experience is no longer a nice to have. It's kind of a necessary for, for any any brand in that space to compete. But we're seeing it even with non luxury brands at a at a much larger scale as well. If you take someone like eBay, you know, they're any any brand the size of uh, you know eBay has more data than they know what to do with. Kind of going back to our prior conversation, sure. And so they've gone at it with a really interesting approach of a very focused set of five or six data points based on the category you're shopping uh-huh. to try and personalize your experience at every touch point with them. So to give you an example, in Motors, that might be the make or the year or the model of your current vehicle versus your dream vehicle, mm-hmm. and kind. Of and customizing all of your parts and accessory different offers to you based on that very simple data point. So it, it's one of those interesting things where regardless of if you're more on the luxury side aiming for personalization or if you're a mass market uh, global brand, we're, we're seeing it come from both ways. And you know the, the stat line for someone like an eBay is when they leverage this more personalized approach using declared data, it actually has driven a 54.5% increase in a pure A-B test. So right. You know, when we get back to the question of what's the motivation for brands to collect data and leverage it, when used thoughtfully, and to your point, when the correct data is in use in these applications and systems, it can be extremely valuable, not only to the consumer because they have a better experience and they find products that might be a little bit more interesting, but obviously to the brand as well and helping drive their bottom line. Perfect. I mean, there's I mean, there's a great, some great results and I mean, and, and really good sort of top line sort of headlines, but. I mean, if I was to say, gentlemen, to if you were to boil it down, to say and sort of imagine that there are some executives, marketing professionals, entrepreneurs, leaders that listen to this 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 interview or reading the highlights, and they're thinking, yeah, we need to get better at the whole marketing and data and personalization, and and or we're just drowning in our data and we kind of we're trying to figure out how to how to do things better. What advice would you be giving them right now? I mean, where, where should they start? What should they do first? The best thing is actually to take a step out of the day-to-day and thinking about what you currently have, whether it's in terms of contents or or, or data or channels, Mm -hmm. and just ask the very simple question, if I had to rank the most important things to know about my consumer, what would that be? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times we find a very helpful antidote on that um, is actually uh, imagining yourself having a a coffee conversation with your consumer for five minutes. Yeah. What are the questions? What are the things you would want to know about them? Whether you're on the B2B side and it's a prospect or whether you're... (coughs) large consumer brand, there's probably a couple things that come to mind. So we would kind of encourage you to think about that. And then at the same time, how does your audience engage with you most frequently? And when are they most in a state of mind of discovery and conversation, as opposed to direct response and action? Right. And if you can kind of think about that, then you can ask uh, and start to activate the very simple execution of putting a couple pieces of content in those more discovery minded moments in asking those couple of things that you would over a coffee in that content and providing immediate value to the consumer through some type of better shopping experience or maybe even an incentive. And so at at its most simplistic form, that's where a lot of marketers and executives start with in thinking about the most important data they need and how to actually collect and use that data. Perfect, I mean, it's, 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 it's old school, kind of back to basics, you know, put yourself in your customer's shoes, or get you know, you know, start flexing or building up your or exercising your your empathy muscles. Uh, really, I mean, but it's because it feels like a lot of those basic things, those basic habits, get kind of lost in a lot of the data and the technology and the maelstrom of 
metrics and, and so on and so forth. But actually, it's a really good advice, I think, about the idea. Just like, just step back and put yourself in your customer's shoes or imagine talking to them and figure out what's important to them. So, yeah, no, sage advice, gentlemen, I think, uh, all round. But I think that's I think that's true, Adrian. I think the you're right. It's sort of back to basics. But also, I think I've been doing marketing for a while. And, and when I talk to other folks in the space, I think what we're seeing is a bit of a paradigm shift. We used to have to rely on qualitative data and psychographic data at a limited scale and infer off of that yeah. and, and build our data models on what we could then get from a vendor, let's say, at scale, yeah. right? There's a paradigm shift where through the, the magic of um, mobile traffic, you can have that one-to-one conversation and, and get that psychographic data. Like Jonathan said, have that cup of coffee with, with your customers and when that data is activated, it's the best data. Mm-hmm. So when when I talk to marketers in the space too, you know, one of the things that I say is the mark the data funnel is flipped. And you can actually lead with differentiated first party qualitative psychographic data at scale. And just to add just another point to that. We're all moving to a direction where proximity to the, to the customer is the most important. Yes. Uh, and why would you why would you outsource that? Do you want to rent that relationship or own it? When you have the right data in house, you can own that relationship and grow it over time versus mm-hmm. rent access to it. Yeah, no, that's I mean, that's that, that's completely like it makes complete sense. I mean, it's it it always it always feels. It always seemed rather. I can understand the economics of it rather, around in you know, an analogous thing is around when people outsource their contact center operations, and I, so I, I get the financial argument for it, but it's a bit like what you're saying: is that do you want to rent that relationship or own it? Particularly when contact centers in, for many brands is one of the first times that people have that human to human contact. And it always struck me as being a kind of a strange thing to do to want to outsource your relationship with your with your with your customer, but that that is that is a conversation that that, that many companies have been having, and and out, the outsourcing business continues to grow. But there's, there's also a lot of people that are bringing things in house. So I think you make a great point. But gentlemen, you know we've talked about a bunch of different things. I mean, is there anything that you I mean, I've asked lots of, lots of questions. Is there anything that you'd like to add that we think that we've missed out in terms of a nuance, a flavor of this sort of thing before I ask you my final question? No, we've really enjoyed the conversation, Adrian. And of course, thank you again for having both Ben and I on. To be honest, the only thing we would add is um, that this is it, this is something that a lot of people are struggling with right now, and yeah. it's okay to have uncertainty and not know the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if there are, are listeners or, or there are folks that are kind of thinking through what their consumer data strategy might be, or how this all comes together, um, you know, certainly feel free to reach out and and uh, uh, and give us a ring um, uh, or go to jevit.com. Um, generally speaking, if you want to get started and kind of do this activity on your own and and, and thinking through this, it's a very th- easy three step process. Um, again, it's thinking about what are the most important data data points you want to collect and what's most important that you don't have today. Mm-hmm. What is the content that you might put in front of people to collect it? And then what what channels and, and how are you going to activate that data, whether it's to personalize your website or whether it's to uh, have a more uh, you know segmented uh, email marketing database. So uh, feel free to visit us at, at jebit.com if you want to continue that conversation. And um, if not, and you still want to continue exploring on your own, that's kind of our our three-step process and how we would recommend approaching this. Perfect. Well, I think you might have just answered my last question because my last question is, is always at the end of these interviews is, is, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? Now, <laughs> I don't think that was a shameless plug, but it was pretty pluggish, and that's kind of fine. But is there anything else that you'd like to shamelessly plug, like world peace or <laughs> a cure for cancer or something? Because, you know, just go for it. Well, now if we say anything other than those, you know, sort of altruistic two things will look terrible. But (laughs) I guess what I would just say, Adrian, is at Jebit, we're we're super excited about this this future that that, um, you know, having a better relationship and a deepened conversation between a brand and consumer can have on both sides. 
for for a brand's bottom line and also for you know what's most important which is what the consumer stands to gain from that and sure. i think that as we enter this this new era of um, transparency and responsible data collection and usage um, both are going to stand to gain and we're excited at Jebit to be, I think, building something that is really world class in, in terms of helping facilitate that solution. Perfect. Jonathan, Ben, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you today. I think it's, you're right in the heart of a really important issue. You know, this idea of giving customers kind of what they want on the terms that they understand and being protective of that you know, which allows then brands to achieve better sort of economic and financial results, longer kind of relationships and all these different things. And so it's a very clever and interesting kind of way to do it. So I, I congratulate you on, on, on what you're doing. I want to thank you for your time today and to, for sharing your insight and perspective and things that, you know, that's been great. So thanks very much. No, thank you very much for having us on. And we appreciate you taking the time to kind of shine a spotlight on these important issues because uh, as you mentioned, it, uh, the world's changing quickly, and uh, we're, we're all here to learn together. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Well, that's it for another interview. I really hope you enjoyed it. Now, every time I complete one of these interviews, I learn something new, and I try and incorporate that new learning into my writing, my speaking, my workshops, and the consulting that I do for my clients. If you're interested, you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswimsco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do listen in again. All the very best. <laughs>